Uh, so I'm Thomas Corcoran, and this is my project titled, I'm a Leader, Not a Follower, Toward an Understanding of Personal, Social, Cultural, and Musical Experiences of Three Male Flute Players. So part of what inspired this study was reading all this literature about musical instruments and gender associations in which the flute was consistently seen as the most feminine instrument. Uh, so I became particularly interested in the perspectives of male flute players. I myself am a male flutist. I was very aware of gender stereotypes as a student, and I'm very aware of them as an educator too. I, um, many elementary and band concerts I go to, I, I see many girls in the front row playing the flute, and lots of boys in the back row playing trumpet, and I always find myself wondering how those students got there. So the purpose of this study was to investigate the experiences of three male flute players, all at different stages of development, which I'll, I'll talk about later. What I'm really interested in is the factors that contribute to participants' flute playing in the past and present, uh, and the ways in which their understandings of social and cultural norms relate to their uh, flute playing experiences. So these are my research questions and they're on your handout. Uh, so as I said, there uh, is a plethora of literature on this topic. Uh, for the sake of this short presentation, I will not go into in depth with any of these studies, uh, but I'm going to talk about how I organize them and how, this research, and how researchers have uh, approached this topic. So the first major topic is instrument selection. This is where uh, researchers examine what students are choosing what instruments and making connections between uh, participants' gender and the instrument that they actually select to play. Another major category is instrument preference. This is generally when researchers give some sort of survey for instrument liking. What instrument do you most prefer? What instrument do you least prefer? And uh, researchers have drawn significant connections between participants' gender and uh, their instrument preference, and even their perception of preference. So for example, uh, a male, a young male might actually like the flute, but he might perceive himself as not being able to like it because of its feminine connotation. Um, the most common uh, theme in the literature is rating instruments as masculine or feminine, generally on some sort of continuum where masculine and feminine represent opposite ends of the continuum, which some people have found uh, problems with, but that, that remains the most common way this topic has been explored. And also types and limitations of participation. So gender associations might limit students from uh, the types of instruments they play and the types of music that they participate in. So initially to me it sort of felt like everyone was saying the same thing in the literature. They were, they were pretty much confirming the existence of these gender stereotypes and these gender associations, but not really going beyond that. I did find two uh, flute male flute specific studies, one of which is by Goldstein, uh, who was a doctoral student at Boston University. He published a dissertation in 2013 on uh, high school male flutists and ex-flutists. And he was, uh, he was exploring uh, the participants' uh, understanding of masculinity and uh, their reasonings for continuing flute study or discontinuing flute study. Taylor, who's from the University of North Texas, I believe, uh, was studying high school male flutists in Texas all-state ensemble. So he was really looking at achievement. So both of these researchers only focused on high school flutists, and both of them called for more researchers of flutists from uh, different levels. So those recommendations sort of led, uh, led to my study, and based off of those recommendations, I incorporated flute players from different stages of development. So I, I started thinking of a beginning player, an intermediate player, and an advanced player, which led me to find an elementary participant, a high school participant, and a college participant. I used a sample of convenience. All my participants were geographically close to me. And also snowball sampling. So someone would lead me to someone else, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was very easy to find an elementary participant. I found the elementary participant through a colleague who's a band teacher at a local school. It was very easy to find a college student. Uh, I sent out 12 emails. I heard back from all 12 of them. <laughs> and they were very, very willing to participate and very excited about the huh. study. They were very excited to talk about some of these issues. Unfortunately, I could not accommodate 12 people, so I decided to choose the first person who responded who seemed very organized and timely, and we had no mutual friends or connections. Uh, interestingly, it was really difficult to find a high school participant. I contacted four high schools with uh, populations greater than 1,500. 
None of them had any male flute players, and two of them even reported that they had they couldn't think of a male flute player in recent memory at their school. Um, so ultimately, I did find I did find a male flute player through a community music school through a private teacher. Uh, so data were collected through interviews, researcher memos, post-interview reflective surveys, and because my participants were at different stages of development, they were at different ages, uh, data collection was different for the youngest participant, the elementary participant. Um, I did interview him, uh, but because he was young and he wasn't as articulate and forthcoming about how he felt, um, I actually made music with him. We made music in our interviews, we played music together. Um, and this and this sort of helped uh, helped me gain a rapport with him. I garnered information that I really wouldn't have otherwise gotten, um, and it really uh, built this sort of sense of camaraderie. Like we were doing something together, we were in it together, we were on the same team. So numerous ethical dilemmas arose during the course of this study. I considered observing participants, like uh, Goldstein did, who wrote the dissertation. He observed participants in uh, music classes and non-music classes. Although there may be uh, things to learn from observing, ultimately I decided for my study, uh, the information gained from, from observing was not really pertinent to the participants' feelings or experiences and perceptions. Uh, so I decided not to observe them. Also, initially, I, I did not want participants to know about the purpose of my study. I didn't want to unfairly lead them to issues of gender if, in fact, it was not uh, applicable to their experience. And for the younger participant, I really didn't feel like it was my place to make the elementary participant aware of this gender stereotype if he was not already aware of it. Ultimately, I decided to be open about the purpose of my study to study male flutists in particular, as the RSRB forms needed to be specific. <laughs> Uh, so, as I said, I am a male flutist, and this certainly contributes to my researcher bias. I was hyper aware of gender stereotypes as a student, and they affected me deeply. Um, I realize that I've read a lot of literature on this topic, I've had a lot of conversations. I probably see these stereotypes more vividly than other people might, and I try to account for this in my study. This is qualitative research, I am the instrument for data collection, so I took a lot of researcher memos right after each interview to sort of reflect on on my bias and my own interpretation. Ultimately, I found that being a male flutist actually helped me to gain rapport with all my participants. Uh, it, it, in fact, one of my participants uh, wanted to be friends with me after our interviews, and we continued meeting regularly after our interviews concluded. Um, and it really helped that I spoke the same language of them as them. It, it felt like, again, we were on the same team. We were sort of in this together. There was a mutual understanding. Uh, I also employed member checking for trustworthiness with participants, so I, I provided them opportunity to edit uh, transcribed interviews, and they did not change anything. So now I'll talk to you about uh, my three participants. Max was my undergraduate participant. Uh, Max wore collared shirts and sweater vests and really nice shoes and glasses. He was very polished and put together and articulate. Uh, he spoke with very proper grammar. Uh, I was actually kind of embarrassed because he was so organized. He showed up earlier to interviews than I did. Uh, that was a little embarrassing. Um, he is uh, an only child, which was really important to him. The relationship with his parents was, was very, very crucial. Uh, he is Caucasian. He is from Seattle, so he sort of described his upbringing and his family as very liberal and free-thinking. Um, and he is studying flute, flute performance. Dante is my high school participant. Uh, Dante was short, very skinny. He wore shorts and t-shirts to all of the interviews, which largely took place in November and December. <laughs> uh, we, we met, he is African American. He, uh, we met at a local coffee shop for interviews, and he brought Wendy's to every single interview. Uh, so so uh, he loves Wendy's. Uh, he is very dedicated. He goes to an arts high school, so he, he practices every single day but Sunday. He told me, he said, I practice arpeggios and thirds and scales and my repertoire every single day for at least, at least an hour or two. So he practices every day but Sunday. He's very dedicated to music making. He, this is his professional goal to be a flutist. 
Isaiah was my elementary participant. Uh, I don't have as many direct quotes as him uh, from him because he was not as forthcoming. Uh, he is a fifth grader. He is also African American. He goes to an urban school. Um, I I collected data in his classroom. So I because I knew the teacher. This uh, also helped to inform my perspective because I had some of the teacher's perspective. Um, as I said, I don't have as many direct quotes, so I have a lot of my own perceptions of him. Uh, he was not forthcoming. He was he gave very short answers. He was very silly. He had a very silly streak to him, and he always wanted to learn really high notes on the flute. <laughs> he wanted to learn the highest notes possible. <laughs> Um, so, uh, my, the findings uh, support was huge for each participant. E every participant really reported having a strong support system. Uh, Max, the undergraduate participant, talked about his parents a lot. He was an only child. He described the relationship with his parents as the most important relationship to him. Uh, he said he feels like he never has to go behind his parents' back to pursue anything. The relationship with his parents was really strong, and, uh, and that continued to uh, allow him to play the flute. Dante, my high school participant, talked a lot about his mom. His mom drove him to rehearsals, to different ensembles, to lessons. She was always at his concerts, always at his recitals. Um, she was very supportive of his flute playing and very proud of him, and uh, always listened to him practice at home. Um, Dante, the high school participant, also uh, talked about financial support. So he actually used to play at a retirement home, and the residents of the retirement home all pitched in to buy him a really high quality flute. Oh, so he had financial support backing him as well, um, which was, was really <coughs> important to his flute playing. Um, Isaiah, the elementary participant, obviously was not so forthcoming about talking about these support systems, but it was very clear that he did have support of others in his life. He talked about his mom, and I actually met his mom at a, a holiday concert. Uh, his band teacher was very supportive of him and very invested in his success. Um, and his peers were really, uh, were really into his flute playing and, and very supportive of him. I actually had the opportunity in one of our interviews, uh, as I said, we were playing a lot of high notes on the flute, so <laughs> we, were, we were getting very winded and we, we, he, he needed a drink of water, so we both took our flutes and walked to the water fountain. And at the water fountain, we ran into this group of friends of his, and, and they saw that he had his flute, and they were like, oh, Isaiah, play us a song. And so he played Mary Had a Little Lamb and Hot Cross Buns, and his friends were cheering and clapping and, and going, yeah, you're so good. How did you get so good? So it was, it was really nice to see that he had really positive peer reaction to uh, his playing and a lot of support. And it was clearly very important to him. He continually referred to this, this moment throughout our interviews as the concert in the hallway. Uh, motivation, as well, was, was very important for, for each participant. Uh, they were motivated by different things, but generally they were all motivated to stand out and differentiate themselves and be different. So being a male flutist is sort of inherently different, but they went even farther to differentiate themselves in various ways. Max, the undergraduate, talked about professionalism and setting himself apart from his peers. He consistently positioned himself as more professional than his peers. He says he takes what he does very seriously, he thinks a lot about it, and, uh, and being professional and being competitive in the, in the world of orchestral auditions and being a professional musician uh, was really important to him to differentiate himself in that way. He also talked about pleasing his teacher, who he said was the best flute player he knows. Dante, the high schooler, also talked about uh, pleasing his teacher. He was very motivated to please his teacher, and he said, disappointing your teacher is the worst feeling in the world. So he, he was very motivated to please her and to make her happy and uh, to, to show her that he was making progress. Um, he was also sort of motivated to differentiate himself from his mom's sisters. He said, all my mom's sisters play clarinet, so I play flute. Um, Isaiah, the elementary participant, was also, he was very motivated to impress his peers and, uh, and be the best flutist in his lesson group. It was very clear in his, in his peer group and his lesson group that he was the best, and this sort of motivated him to get even better. And, uh, and finally, understanding of social and cultural norms. So for this category, this is where I really expected gender to arise and, and be a big issue. And it, it did arise, but what surprised me was that race really came up a lot. My high school participant, who is, who is black, um, talked a lot about racial stereotypes. He said he feels like a lot of his black friends 
uh, chose stereotypical black instruments, such as drums, saxophone, and trumpet. He said that they all want to be like Wynton Marsalis. And he said that for him, he loves classical music, he loves playing the flute. There aren't as many African-American male role models for him. And so he talked a lot about racial expectations, even more so than gender norms. He did, he did talk about the fact that um, the flute is considered girly and that he thinks, he, he said it's bogus, but, um, but race, race came up even more with him. <coughs> Max, the undergraduate, talked a lot about this phenomenon of flute girls, which are these numerous uh, hordes of girls, he said, who, who, uh, who take up the beginning and intermediate stages of flute playing, but actually are not very talented and are not very serious about what they do. He said generally they're following what their friends are doing. They're doing it because their friends are doing it and they don't take it seriously. Um, he said in his experience boys were generally better than girls. Uh, homosexuality also came up in this category with this undergraduate participant, although this did not surprise me because it seemed like the only uh, stage of development where, where a topic like that would arise. Um, Isaiah, my elementary participant, uh, I, did, I did ask him about the flute and I said, some people think it's a girly instrument, what do you think? And he, he said, it's not girly, it's an instrument. It, instruments aren't for boys or girls. And so I thought this was very progressive and I was sort of happy to hear this, although I did uh, sense a very defensive tone in his voice. Um, so the, the motivation to set oneself apart was really important in this study. Um, my high school participant said, I'm a leader, not a follower. All of, all of my participants consciously set themselves apart. And this was positive. They were happy to be different. They were happy to set themselves apart from their peers in different ways. Um, they were also all motivated to not let down people who cared about them or helped them throughout their flute playing. And uh, all of them mentioned their parents. All of their parents listened to the practice. All the parents were supportive of their flute playing. And this is consistent with a finding from Taylor, who earlier, who uh, studied achievement amongst uh, the Texas Allstate flutists. And uh, the motivation to set oneself apart is also consistent with Goldstein, who wrote a dissertation. Um, uh, he, he also said that male flutists were particularly invested in setting themselves apart. Um, Goldstein, however, Goldstein said that um, elementary or middle school students might experience the feminine stereotype more directly. But this was actually not true in my study. My elementary participant um, had the most progressive views on, uh, on these gender associations. So the implications for this study include that male flutists may need specific supports that are not necessary for other instrumentalists. Um, uh, even, even other students who play sex stereotyped instruments, they might need supports that perhaps a female trombone player doesn't need. Um, I also the implications also include that music teachers should consider providing education to parents especially, but also presenting as much information to sort of counteract these stereotypes. So showing videos of uh, male flute players or, or female rock and roll players or, uh, or other examples to sort of counteract um, these expectations. Um, also teachers should give students opportunities to feel successful and those opportunities will hopefully lead to students being able to set themselves apart or feeling like they're special or set themselves apart from their peers. And also to not, uh, teachers or parents should make no assumptions about what is inspiring their, their students musically. Um, so su some suggestions for f further research include female perspectives. It would be naive to think that female flute players do not contend with these gender stereotypes, and I would be interested to hear uh, what their perspectives are. In fact, when I, when I uh, was finding my male participants, I, I used um, a female friend who plays the flute, and she became a little defensive asking her, when I asked her uh, to leave me two male flute players, because she said, we, you know, we deal with these stereotypes too. So I think it would be interesting to, to hear those perspectives. Additionally, teacher perspectives I think would be really interesting. There's a lot of research on how males and females are motivated differently. And so I would love uh, to hear uh, the perspectives of teachers who, who maybe teach male and female flutists to see what differences they might, they might perceive. Also, urban versus suburban. Uh, it just so happened that in my study, my elementary and high school participants were black and from urban areas and, and went to urban schools. Um, and uh, in many of my conversations with colleagues, and one in particular, um, 
the fact was drawn to my attention that sometimes parents are the ones who transmit these gender stereotypes to their kids. And one colleague who teaches in an urban school said that in her experience, uh, where urban parents might be less involved in their students or in their children's lives, um, those gender stereotypes might not be as visible or understood or perceived. So I think it would be very interesting to to uh, study urban and suburban schools and understand the difference between between those types of students. <laughs> and that is my presentation. Thank you. Let me know if you would like a copy of my paper or a, a more exhaustive list of my references. Yeah, so now's an opportunity for you to take some questions. Questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> uh, let's say next year you go out and you're a beginning uh, band teacher. Uh -huh. How are you going to, uh, or do you care, uh, whether you get males and females playing flute, or how would you go about getting them? since it's so stereotyped now? Um, I think I would care, and it would depend on the numbers. Um, you know, if it, if it was one lone male, male flutist in a, in a pack of, of females, or vice versa, you know, one female in the low brass section, I would probably, um, you know, speak with that student individually and, and uh, you know, give them resources to, to make sure that they have role models or, or that they understand that there are other people out there doing this. and. And, um, and just give them opportunities to maybe have a solo or, or an opportunity for them to, to sort of uh, be, feel, feel really successful so they could motivate themselves to keep playing. But you're asking before they choose an instrument though, right? Yeah, it's really... Before they choose. Yeah. yeah. How do you get them to start on flute? I mean, if you go back, well, I don't know how many years you'd have to go back to find um, a female playing in a major symphony. It wouldn't be, I mean, I suppose if you went back 50 years, probably you wouldn't find any females playing. Yeah. I, I'm guessing that by off. But um, I just think myself, when I've seen not so many, but if you, if you want to be a beginner and play the flute, you have to see some beginners playing the flute. Mm -hmm. I mean, somehow you have to create that mm -hmm. situation. Yeah, I, you're, you're absolutely right, and it's something that I, I don't have an answer for and, and am struggling with, and, and a lot of the research that I have read has said, because a lot of people will say, give them, give them role models, so show them male flutists, but in a study I read that, um, that did instrument modeling mm -hmm. for beginning students, um, one school they used uh, gender consistent modeling, and the other one they did atypical uh, gender, and um, it didn't actually persuade more boys to play the flute, it actually dissuaded girls, more girls from playing the flute. So I, I don't, I really, I don't know. That's a great question. Just to go off of that, I mean, I have to offer all of the instruments to my students, so I think it's really important that you show them every single instrument, and I, I didn't do anything specific to be like, oh, I'm going to try and encourage more boys to do this, more girls to do this, but mm -hmm. I just made sure everyone got to try every instrument, and I told them to be really careful and pick which one they liked how it sound. And I said, don't pick the one your friend is playing because you can still play your instrument with, their fr with your friend if you have a different instrument. Mm -hmm. We can still all play songs together, so pick which one you really like. I don't know if that necessarily made a huge difference, but I think really giving them access to all of those options is mm -hmm. important. Um, I have a question about um, just research methodology. I've been thinking about um, starting back to study some more student collaboration, not teacher collaboration, but I've been really afraid of this phenomenon that you described, which is what Lynn Grossman and I also found in her classroom. We could not get the kids to talk to us. Mm -hmm. so we could not get in a, you know, very rich data from them. So what advice do you have for researchers that do want to collect data from and with children and, and get their voices more into the literature? <laughs> Another, I you know, I don't feel like an expert at all, um, but, but, um, but you know, playing music with him really allowed me to to just uh, I don't know, sort of barriers broke down in that way. But I I, I don't know in a large classroom. I would I would say it it would have to be in a more individual setting. But if you're doing if you're studying groups, then um, then then I'm not sure. But I, I think it it would be important to to see them in different contexts and see them 
I mean, as, as I said, like the, when I when we left the classroom and went to the water fountain, that was like one of the, the mm -hmm. greatest uh, mm -hmm. experiences for my data collection. And um, so I think just seeing students in different contexts and maybe seeing how they interact in the hallway, in the classroom, in the front of the school, at lunch, mm -hmm. um, which would be which would be very difficult, but so like not just like following out after recess and seeing yeah. how they were just and would they just get more used to you by then and yeah. that's, part, that's part of it. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, um, they'd be more natural. I don't know. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your effort to to um, get the elementary school participant because I know that's something that people have had trouble with. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was that group of friends mixed gender or do you remember? Yeah. Yep. Okay. That's yep. true. And I believe he was in a lesson group of all male flute players. As, as sort of a follow-up to that point, did any of the male flute players that you worked with talk about other male flute players that they may have begun with who all of a sudden were disappearing <laughs> and either how that made them feel or, or you know, any, in, anything interesting come up about No, that? it didn't come up. It didn't come up. And that was something I was surprised about. Um, and uh, it, it, the two flute-specific studies I mentioned, one of them mm -hmm. talked about other male flute players being the greatest source of, of uh, uh, friendship for these mm -hmm. for the, these these students, um, but also the other one was uh, was exploring ex flutists, yes. and uh, I I didn't find um, any any uh, anyone talking about that, yeah. and um, and I don't know if it wasn't pertinent to their experience, but I'm I'm sure that that did happen, mm -hmm. um, and I would love to be able to locate those students because I yeah. think that also would serve as really great data, mm -hmm. um, but no. What do you um, attribute? I mean, th I'm just curious about these. This lesser group of all male flute players. I mean, that's you know almost unheard of, it seems. Yeah. But I'm, so I'm wondering in that little microcosm, <coughs> what you would attribute that to. But then also, do you do you feel like um, in, in either through the research literature you looked at or over time, is there a, a shift in the or a, a softening of these? Um, well, well, Abelis and Porter, who really like pioneered this this whole topic, um, they did a, their first study was in 1978, and then they did a follow up study in 2008, and they they essentially concluded mm -hmm. that nothing has changed and that these still hold very strong. Um, but um, to the other part of your question, uh, which is sort of what I tried to address at the end, is um, I I do think in urban schools that kids might just not be exposed to. To, to these stereotypes, um, or they might they might not be so vivid for them. Um, and or, or the race component. I mean, it's just this, there's a stereotype there, but it's functioning at a different level. It's like yeah. all of those instruments are for it. Yeah, in yeah. And so, and so a lot of the research that I read specifically talked about suburban students and, you know, a lot of dads who were like, well, you shouldn't play the flute. Right? You don't want to yeah. get made fun of, right? And even parents who would, like, contact music teachers with concern, like, is this bad for my kid? Is he gonna get beat up or something? I remember, like, when I went to Miami, coming down off the escalator at the airport, and there was a giant portrait of, I guess it was a Miami guy or maybe Cuban, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's someone famous. I'm sure jazz people would know who he was, but he's a flutist. Mm -hmm. You know, there was this giant. He had a beret and sunglasses <laughs> on. You know, it's like, welcome to Miami, yeah. viva la jazz or something like that. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, wow, if that is like the kind of thing that you see all the time. That's totally different than yeah. the images that we are sort of bombarded with about flute. Yeah, flute and it's also interesting because at the be professional with, in the Hispanic community. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, and at the professional level, there's many male flute players. The yes. most famous flute players in the world are still male, so it still it still uh -huh. seems unique to the beginning stages where these gender yeah. stereotypes are most uh, are I don't know people are aware of them most. This goes back to Dr. Bruno's question: How does it start? How did it start for you? How did it start for me? Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, well, <laughs> I got the clear feeling, not through flute playing, through participating in singing and musical theater, um, which, I don't know if you've heard, are also sort of feminine. <laughs> uh, I, I, got, I got a very clear, clear sense from my peers who were vocal and my teachers who were, who were not as vocal, that I was doing something that I sort of wasn't supposed to be doing. And it made no sense to me because I, in my experience, the females in elementary school who broke feminine stereotypes, like the really tomboy girls who were on sports teams, right. were celebrated in my school. Mm -hmm. 
And and I was doing feminine things, and every and my my peers were giving me a hard time, and even teachers were sort of like, oh, we've been musical. So I don't know when it started, but it it was always my understanding of how others saw me. So but yeah. how did you pick flute to play? Flute? I I so okay. So I I need to tell this story. I didn't <laughs> play flute in school. I learned flute on my own outside of school. Was that part of it? Was like, I'm not bringing that thing to school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I already have enough feminine things to do. Did you get beat up a lot? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you something that I think will share some insight to that because I've done a ton of information on recruiting. Mm -hmm. All right? But you need to know about the instrumental timbre preference test. Mm -hmm because that will shoot through it. A good recruiting program, I want to tell you, will, will solve a lot of the problems you're talking about. But people don't really spend time recruiting in a serious way, and as a result, kids just go for stereotypes. I did. Mm -hmm. I started on euphonium. I didn't like carrying the thing around, and I played trumpet because it was a cool thing for guys to play. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to play the flute or the clarinet mm -hmm. because I liked the sound of them. That's what really was the attraction. But I think a lot of the reason why everybody's playing flute is because the teachers don't really know how to recruit kids. Mm -hmm. And I hate that word, but uh, recruit. It sounds like you're in the army or something. <laughs> they don't know how to support kids. <laughs> that should be the next study of people who won't wish they played flute. Yeah, yeah right, no yeah. kidding. I think there's, a, there's also a preference to just for the feel of the <laughs> instrument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if you, I, I feel this feels really good to me. Yeah. Right? This is like unnatural. <laughs> I mean, I've, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what's this? Hey, hey. <laughs> 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 it is. There is a physical feel for an instrument. Yeah. That, and people don't even look at that. They just <laughs> let kids go by stereotypes. Yeah. It's just, it's the director's fault more than anything else. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. I think we should probably wrap up our questions, but I'm sure Tommy will welcome more questions later if you, if you have more. Thank you.